SOG FPV, one of the indicators that a new FPV video transmission technology is ready for prime time is how easy is it to use in smaller FPV builds. An example is when the CADEX Vista release for the DJI HD system, um, it was used widely in smaller sub three inch builds, uh, mostly CineWoops. Also, um, Another example is when the 25 by 25 whoop board came out from Fat Shark, now HD0. So the new kit on the block is the Fat Shark Rock Snell Digital FPV system. So this is a proof of concept build video to answer the question, is Rock Snell uh, Digital FPV system viable in a sub three inch and sub 100 gram class quad? So hopefully this build video will answer that question. But before we get started, I want to just uh, set out a little disclaimer. I'm not recommending that you take a perfectly good Darwin baby ape to do this conversion. Again, this is just a proof of concept. If you're bent on doing a conversion, you might consider the HD0 board, which is lighter uh, than the Waxnell. But in the end, I'll describe how there is an advantage with the Waxnell, and that is the onboard DVR. So we'll get into that later in the video. So let's get started with the build. So in the Avatar HT Nano Kit, you get the VTX itself with the, the Nano Camera and the MIPI cable. You get uh, two VTX antennas. You get a programming cable. Um, you get a adapter and um, a cable to wire the a cable harness to wire the thing up and uh, some screws. So the weight of the camera and the VTX and the MIPI cable is coming in at about 19 grams. So I'm not including the antenna because I'm going with a much lighter um, dipole antenna. Need to remove seven screws. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven. Have the top plate off. I'm gonna go ahead and remove the VTX by disconnecting it from the camera here. And then uh, desoldering it off the flight controller board. The VTX, and now I'm going to desolder the wire harness and remove the camera. So I'm using these Micro-V VTX antennas. They're very, very lightweight, but perform really well, and they're not that expensive. So the white wire goes to RX1, and the gray wire goes to TX1 on the flight controller. So these are the two UART ones that you're gonna be using. Again, that's white wire on UART1 RX and the gray wire on UART1 TX. So as far as VBAT um, on the top of the flight controller next to the um, battery pigtail. There is a pad right here which is uh, positive VCC or VBAT positive and then uh, VBAT ground is over on this other pad so it was a, a fairly large pad for you to have access to to uh, hook up uh, ground and power. The thing I am going to do is put this little micro buzzer on this quad um, it's the quad so small that I want to be able to uh, find it when I park fly. So this weighs about a gram is all. If you add wires, about one and a half grams. So it's worth it. All right, I have the buzzer hooked up. You can see that this is buzz plus, and then right next to it is buzz minus. And I went ahead and uh, since I don't need this antenna, Coming off the VTX, I went ahead and just used the as a hole for the buzzer to sit in. Before we proceed any further, I'm going to use this uh, short saber tooth from Vifly. I really like this product. Everything's plugged in. I'm going to make sure everything works properly. And uh, this just protects you if there's any shorts. So let's go ahead and try it. So looks like I don't have any shorts and the flight controller powered up the buzzer buzzed and uh, next I'll make sure this is getting uh, power to the VTX 
and camera. So looks like everything is wired up correctly so far. So I'm using some capped on tape, um, really as just a thin insulation layer. This uh, Express LRS antenna UFL connector sits a little high. So I figured if something in a crash, if it got compressed, you know, and you hit the top, um, they'll protect it a little bit. Um, and then also um, prevent shorting out on some of these components, the case of the VTX for the walks now. So it's pretty tight in here. I mean, there is a gap in here, but just want to make sure that uh, I have a little bit of insulation here. So I'm using 20 millimeter M2 bolts with plastic nuts as the spacer. Um, 18 might work. I actually have some 18 uh, millimeter M2 screws that are pan head. Um, the reason I went with pan head so that you have um, it doesn't sit above the heat sink um, because of the clearance. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass this through the top and then use a nut, um, a locking nylon nut on the bottom. I'm going to show you what this looks like. Before I put the top plate on, it uh, turned out pretty nice. Um, it has, uh, you know, still has squishy movement, not excessively so, but uh, really thought the locking nuts really helped out here. Uh, the concern with just using plastic nuts is that they work themselves off. Uh, I wasn't able, which it really doesn't matter. Um, I couldn't put a nut on the back here next to the USB connector because it was interfering with the USB uh, plug. So uh, that really doesn't matter because, you know, I did use um, uh, plastic nuts on the underside. So that's going to hold it in place anyway. So not too concerned about that. And then I have three solid points. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, it's a pretty tight fit. But... Turned out pretty good. Those of you that have been in the hobby for a while know that there are just some builds that are just cursed. And I happened to run into that curse with this particular um, proof of concept Darwin slash walk snail build. The first thing that happened, and so I'm not probably going to blame Darwin, is this um, flight controller is rated at 3S. So when I was updating the firmware on the uh, VTX, the Waxnell VTX, I was using a 3S battery, and it is spec'd at 3S, but if you look at the website for this particular bind and fly quad, it says 1S and 2S. So I'm not going to blame them, but their spec for this flight controller says 3, 3S, so 1S to 3S. Um, but when you look at it, um, when I was uh, updating the firmware, um, I let the smoke out, and you can see this FET right here blew. So luckily, I had another Darwin uh, flight controller. I really like it because it has Express LRS built into it, which saves weight, and it makes a nice like toothpick build. Uh, so I had one readily available to replace it. Well, then the next thing that happened is I had a bad motor, and I couldn't uh, really quickly get a replacement motor from Darwin, so I went ahead and used these hyper light motors that I've had for like two years that I was going to use on a toothpick build. And I really like these motors. Um, and uh, so I ended up swapping out the motors. So the only thing that I have that's really a Darwin based is the frame and the flight controller. But that's just part of the hobby. Um, that just happens. So um, next I'm going to show you uh, flight video. I'm going to take it out. I've already flown it once just to make sure the thing wouldn't blow up in, um, in uh, smoke and flames and uh, didn't. It seems to fly fairly well just to cruising around a little bit but uh, wanted to get uh, uh, you know some video of its final configuration before I crash it or break the frame or do something else crazy because I've just been having bad luck with this build. I've actually
So let's get a weight in its final configuration and why I think this is a viable build. So if we look at it, it comes in at 68 grams with props and also I'm using a rubber band um, to hold the battery in place. So if you think about it, this has an onboard DVR that records in 1080p. So you don't need an external camera. So let's compare that to its competition, which would be this Emax Tiny Hawk 2 Freestyle, which is also coming in at 68 grams. And of course you have the added weight of the TPU mount, but you typically would run, um, like in my case, an Insta360. So that's coming in at 87 grams. So 19 grams heavier. And why I'm saying this is comparable is because this is a 1080p, this is the V1 of the Insta360. And um, you know, you're looking at um, 19 grams heavier. So that's why I think that this build I just did is definitely viable because you don't need an external camera. And it's probably the, the uh, smallest build you'd want to put the Waxnell VTX in, but it's very viable. I'm only going to briefly touch on the Fat Shark Waxnell technology viability. It's very important. But if you want the details, I would go to Mads Tech or Joshua Barbell's channel to get a better understanding. I'll put links to their channels uh, below. The technology at a high level is the same is in the same pedigree as a DGI system. Not the same silicon or firmware, but they're both based off of the lead core system on chip technology. Um, the P1 chip that DGI puts into their OcuSync systems is very similar to the Artisan chipset. Um, the Artisan chipset is just a newer version of it. It supports the H.265 codec versus the H.264 codec for the P1 chip. So to me, that's a good thing because we know that um, this technology is going to have legs in it. So um, I wouldn't be concerned about the chipset that they're currently using in uh, the Waxnail slash Fat Shark um, transceivers and goggles. I think this is uh, a very sound system as far as the hardware goes. So um, moving on to image quality, I'm running with the latest firmware at the time of this video, which is 23.23.4. The prior version had a lot of video stuttering and for me was almost uh, not flyable at 25 milliwatts. Um, but with this latest firmware, I did not see any of the stuttering and I was running at 200 milliwatts, 720p um, at 120 FPS, and I uh, switched on the 50 megabits per second mode. Overall, I think Fat Shark and Walk Snail Digital FP Systems has a lot of promise. It's, uh, I think once they get um, the focus mode in place, I think it's going to be very equivalent to the DJI system and at 1080p. Um, if they get the latency down, um, I think it'll be better than the DJI system. So give it another four to six months, six months, and as fast as they're putting out firmware releases, if they keep that up, I think it'll go head to head with the DJI digital uh, FPZ, FPV system. One of the wild cards that you need to consider is the DJI Avada FPV drone. Um, there has been an FCC filing, and that usually means that um, it's just around the corner as far as uh, the release date. So they did an FCC filing on both the uh, Cine Whoop Quad itself, as well as the Goggles 2, plus a new air unit. So it might be smart just to hold off on the uh, Waxnell Fat Shark system until you see what's going on with DJI. My understanding is uh, this is going to be more targeted towards videographers and um, so you know take that with a grain of salt. Lastly I think um, we really need to mention HD0. Um, I am new to using HD0 but so far um, I have been thoroughly impressed with it. If you are an FPV racer um, which the requirements are are lower lower latency, or you fly um, legacy drones like I do, or whoops, 
Um, I really think the HD0 uh, system is very compelling as an alternative to both DJI and the new Fat Shark Walk Snell Digital FPV system. So um, please keep that in mind. I know that they're going to be coming out with a new set of goggles. For me, the big thing is, you know, that it supports both analog and, eight and HD systems. So I don't know. To me, that's uh, a big plus. But uh, overall, I think uh, definitely the Waxnell Fat Shark system um, is definitely a contender. And um, I think they do have the advantage of being... Uh, a lot of times it's first to market mover advantage, but in this case it's almost like third to market advantage because they're leveraging off the technology um, that was uh, in place uh, with the um, chipset, the P1 chipset, that um, pedigree, and so they kind of had a um, that kind of jump started them. So overall, um, you know, if you're an early adopter, I would say that. Uh, yeah, this is definitely a good alternative to the DJI system. So with that, thanks for watching my channel.